Well, our first speaker will be Peter Banks, He's going to give us a review on plasma sphere ion sphere coupling. I think Ian has given us a, a very excellent introduction to the, the broad uh, problems that face us in magnetosphere, magnetosphere coupling, uh, ionosphere now being a word we don't mention except to people who've measured it for years. Uh, my own part, I found that uh, being up here four days early has introduced certain problems in remembering quite what we want to do up here, <laughs> and uh, I'll have to quite uh, remember what I'm talking about, I guess. The, Entire purpose of my talk is to bring you up to date uh, over the past several years on what's going on in the plasma sphere and the flows that occur along the magnetic field lines, uh, the exchange of mass between the uh, lower magnetosphere and the inner magnetosphere and the outer magnetosphere. There's a, a terrible problem of nomenclature here. Uh, we have a protonosphere, which is uh, difficult to interpret because sometimes the protons aren't there. Uh, we have the inner magnetosphere, which can mean uh, the regions close to the Earth, or uh, you have to talk about what's going on at high latitudes. And all in all, it's a very uncertain uh, area, and we probably should have some international commission decide on proper terminology so we know what we're all talking about. I'd like to show uh, in the first slide. <laughs> it works if you just press down. Uh, this is a bit of a problem seeing the slide from this angle. Uh, a, a view, essentially, which is uh, of our own ignorance of what's going on rather than what we know. Uh, much of what's there is incorrect. Uh, it's smooth because we don't have the measurements to give us the detail, which uh, it would illustrate the true physical processes. Uh, this is a slide that uh, Ian and I cooked up several years ago. Uh, there are many things that now go on in this particular slide that uh, aren't indicated there. With respect to thermoplasma, which we're concerned with here, uh, we're talking about plasma with energies between perhaps a hundredth of an EV going up to perhaps five electron volts. And we know that uh, we have three general regions uh, where thermoplasma uh, is found, easily found. Uh, we have the plasmosphere region in here, which is surrounded by ring current. Uh, perhaps this should have been rotated around out of the plane of the slide. We have a, a trough region, which uh, it probably exists just to the equatorward edge of the plasma sheet. Uh, the plasma sheet possibly being the uh, projection of the uh, diffuse aurora. Discrete aurora occurring on the high latitude side of the plasma sheet. And then we have the large uh, polar cap region where we have a, an absence of plasma, uh, presumably because we have these outflows that Ian was referring to uh, along these long field lines which may connect out through this or in some way uh, essentially exhaust the plasma that's uh, stored there. We have a number of, of different problems uh, that are uh, hidden by a nice, uh, neat schematic like this. Uh, for instance, we have to ask, what is the distribution of ionization along the magnetic field lines, looking down like that? We really have no idea. We know what it looks like up to about 3,000 kilometers, that is at the lowest parts in here, and we know that when you fly a satellite across it, you see a very sharp density discontinuity, the plasma pause, but we really don't know how it's adjusting itself along the magnetic field line in response to pressure gradients, uh, gravity, which is uh, just relatively unimportant. It just isn't isn't something you really need to do and put in theoretical studies. Uh, we may have parallel electric fields induced by uh, ring current protons with uh, anisotropic uh, pitch angle distributions. We don't know if the thermal plasma can actually penetrate through those particles efficiently. This may affect some of the things that uh, Richard Thorne will talk about later. Uh, we just really are in a, a vast state of ignorance of the way that this uh, cool plasma interacts with the, the hot plasma. Uh, there's been quite a bit of emphasis on the way that uh, hot particles can be precipitated into the atmosphere through pitch angle scattering, but it's not clear what the uh, inverse uh, coupling is, how do the hot plasma affects the, uh, the cold plasma. The trough uh, one knows about through uh, various um, ionosonde records. I'll show you uh, examples in several moments. Uh, I didn't believe that the trough was as big a tr problem until this past week or two weeks ago in Chattanooga where we operated the, the radar for a period of eight hours and saw nothing. Nothing means any ionization with densities greater than 10 to the fourth. And we thought maybe the, we were off frequency or something was wrong with the radar, but it turned out an AFCRL ionosonde also flew all the way from Anchorage up to Sachs Harbor and saw nothing. And it was clear that they were in the trough. Uh, the densities were lower than 10 to the fourth over an enormous spatial uh, distance and obviously a, a large longitudinal section also. The 
Polar wind regions, uh, the high latitude regions, I'll spend a little more uh, time on uh, in, later in the talk because we have some new results uh, having to do not only with the, the force balance producing density distributions and velocity uh, distributions along field lines, but uh, there have been recent improvements in our understanding of the thermal structure. And we now know that uh, joule heating caused by uh, O plus, uh, H plus collisions can heat the protons very substantially. And there are certain solutions that have been done in England and at UCSD, which uh, lead to plasma temperatures as high as 10,000 degrees, with uh, very strong temperature gradients, something that wasn't uh, predicted uh, previously. Well, if I could go to the next slide. Down. Oops. Oh, it works now. OK, forward. There we go. Uh, I, I have two slides that have been taken from the Alouette 2, uh, which is a, a convenient way of getting vertical profiles of electron concentration uh, below about 3,000 kilometers. There are many other sources of data like this, but I wanted to show uh, at least one example of what a trough looks like down in here when you plot uh, invariant latitude running from, say, 50 degrees here to uh, 80 degrees here with electron density running up and down like this. And for my own orientation, here's a density of about 10 to the fifth. And this is what the latitudinal distribution of plasma looks like at 500 kilometers altitude, 1,000, 1,500, 2,500, and 3,000 kilometers. I'm sorry, the last one's 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. And you see that across the, uh, the upper part of the ionosphere, you have no great density discontinuity. You can see that the total density is accommodating, reaching a minimum in here, but it's not very dramatic. When you look at 2,500 kilometers, you see uh, what looks like part of the plasma sphere coming into a deep trough, and then what's probably the uh, edge of the auroral oval, and then going on up into the polar cap. You can see this in a slightly different way in the next slide, which is also taken from Alouette II, an earlier paper by Nelms and Lockwood, where they plot plasma concentrations as a function of geographic uh, latitude in here with a slight longitude effect. And you see that uh, just by the general appearance here that you have a very steep wall at the edge of the plasma sphere and very depressed densities. Uh, the density changes very rapidly with altitude in here. And this is a, essentially the hole in the torus, which is uh, a feature that's associated with the, the plasma flow. Well, the, the physics of the flow, I'm getting a very bad reflection up here. Can you see it from back there? It all is it intense enough? Uh, I'll have to stand out slightly. The, there are a number of different factors which go into uh, the, the flow of exchange of mass between the, the plasma sphere and the or flow upwards along the field lines into the inner magnetosphere and out of the ionosphere. Uh, we have here the typical F2 peak, which I won't discuss. We know that there's photoionization, there's chemistry involved in the uh, production and loss of ionization. And we know that below, uh, somewhere from here on down that the general ion flow is downwards, and from here it's upwards. And we also know that as a result of chemistry, we have charge exchange between uh, O plus and neutral atomic hydrogen, which is distributed fairly uniformly around the Earth, that uh, we can produce protons. They have a chemical equilibrium region here, and they go into a flow-dominated uh, uh, region somewhere near around 650 kilometers. And the actual density distribution above that altitude is determined essentially by the pressure boundary conditions that you're going to put on the protons. If you put a very low pressure boundary condition, then the protons want to flow upwards. Uh, you're changing uh, O plus into H plus. It flows upwards. In that case, the density distribution falls off rapidly with altitude, and you have fluxes on the order of uh, perhaps 10 to the 8th uh, per square centimeter per second. And that uh, flow rate depends very uh, directly with the concentration of hydrogen. You have to be careful in doing this because if you take too many uh, uh, atoms of hydrogen away from the lower atmosphere, you're depleting the atmosphere then. The charge exchange can't go as rapidly and your flux uh, is uh, cut down. And uh, Tom Donahue at Pittsburgh has been working very extensively on this particular problem. The various factors that affect uh, the, the protons I've tried to indicate over here. I'll read them to you. Uh, in terms of the forces acting on protons, you have a parallel electric field, which is produced by electron pressure gradients. You have a gradient in the ion pressure itself. Uh, you have gravity, of course, acting. And you have friction between the protons trying to move relative to the, the O plus. So you have a large momentum equation, which is coupled with the O plus density distribution. Uh, 
in terms of thermal effects, uh, we have in this region in here, and if, as long as you have an outflow of plasma, uh, you have a thermal heating effect. The O plus and H plus have differing flow velocities, therefore there's a dual heating taking place. The protons get the worst end of it. They get heated very strongly, the O plus relatively uh, to a lesser extent. And the proton temperature rises until in the region here, around 3,500 kilometers, you have proton temperatures uh, substantially larger than the O plus temperatures, which are larger than the electron temperature. And I'll show some examples, some computational examples. And this is rather a different view of the thermal plasma than we've had before. In addition, in the uh, energy balance, you have to include thermal conduction for the ions. The protons and the O plus have thermal conduction effects. Uh, finally, you get up high enough, you find that the proton uh, mean bulk velocity is greater than this uh, random thermal velocity. Uh, this was the uh, old idea of the polar wind. Uh, it turns out still to be true with the new temperature effects, but its uh, transition altitude has moved upward slightly. Finally, the protons come into a flow regime where collisional effects uh, simply are no longer important. The left-hand side of the energy balance equation uh, dominates. And for steady flows in that case, you have that the velocity times the temperature to the two-thirds power is equal to a constant. So as the velocity goes up, uh, the temperature goes down. And that's essentially an adiabatic case. You aren't pumping energy in from other sources. That probably isn't true in the magnetosphere since there are various wave uh, particle interactions that can soak up energy or take out energy. In the next slide, I would like to show just some of these typical computations, trying to give you a feeling for what we know about the physics of what's happening now. Uh, we're plotting here the uh, proton density, or just the ion density, as a function of altitude, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 kilometers. And what we've tried to do is put different pressure boundary conditions up at the top, up, up at some high altitude, 4,000 kilometers, and to show what the density distribution of the uh, different ions uh, is. In the case uh, A, shown here at the far right-hand side, it turns out that uh, this is the flux over here. We actually are pushing protons down into the atmosphere. And you see it has this typically very straight appearance, and it's sort of bulgy down on the bottom as you convert protons into O+. Uh, the difference between that and going to an outflow is very small in terms of a pressure boundary condition. Here, the, we had an inflow of uh, 10 to the 8th, 2 times 10 to the 8th. A very slight change in density down to something like 7 times 10 to the 3 brings us to an outflow of about 5 times 10 to the 7th. If we reduce that pressure boundary or density boundary condition, we have, uh, quickly move into a limiting flux region, and you can see the effect on the, the proton density profile. We show here uh, the O plus profile, this density profile corresponding to this particular proton uh, profile, and this O plus profile corresponding to this full outflow. In any case, once you get to a de uh, density boundary condition, which is somewhere in here, you find that you're, not be, uh, you're into a limited flux region. You can't, you've saturated the flow. You can't get any more protons out by dropping down further and further in density. What happens is the vo velocity of the flow rises as you drop down like that. And in fact, some of the calculations you make, you have to include the inertial term for the plasma uh, in order to get the right results. But these are all for du dt equal to zero, a steady state sort of situation. In the next slide, I'd like to show the uh, thermal structure that goes along with that. And what we're plotting here is ion temperature as a function of altitude. Uh, we have, this is proton temperature. The dotted lines in here are O plus temperature. Uh, these are self-consistent solutions to the continuity, momentum, and thermal balance equation between an altitude of 500 kilometers going up to 4,000. As a consequence of dual heating, trying to draw the protons through the relatively stationary O+, you're getting a lot of energy dissipated. Uh, this particular profile corresponds to the, the maximum left-hand side density, lowest density proton profile shown in the last slide. And you see the temperature rises to about uh, 9,000 volts, about an EV. And uh, the temperature that you rise, uh, rise to depends upon the uh, particular parameters that you put into it. The uh, O plus temperature in this particular case is shown here at about 3,000 degrees. Uh, this was a completely self-consistent solution. We had electron temperature with thermal conduction. The temperature gradient there looks something like this. It was a very realistic profile. The point is you have a case where the proton temperature is greater than the electron temperature, and the O plus temperature, I guess, in that case was less than the electron temperature. So it contradicts slightly what I said, said before. So uh, we can go through some of the... Uh, 
things just to show what the, the various energy balance term looks at. The most important one here has to do with joule heating. You see that the protons are very he uh, strongly heated somewhere near 1,000 kilometers. You have advective terms and uh, the effect of production, loss of ionization, uh, all sorts of other thermal terms involved here. But by far the most important is this joule heating, which was left out of uh, lots of the original polar wind work and most of the thermal plasma flow work that's uh, gone on up to this time. This group, as I said, it. Uh, I think Roy Moffat will have more to say about this uh, in his talk. It's a very interesting aspect because we're not certain now what happens to the proton temperature as we go into the magnetosphere itself. We simply do ionospheric types of calculations uh, with uh, particular types of boundary conditions. In the next slide, I wanted to illustrate this idea of the flux saturation level. It, uh, the top side ionosphere is like a super diode. Uh, you have essentially just two curves, a horizontal, this is flux plotted against uh, high altitude pressure or density. You have a limiting flux si uh, situation here, and then you uh, are free to draw almost as much flux as you want in that direction. So you can push plasma in. If you make, uh, suddenly push in a lot of plasma at the top of the plasma sphere, you can push anything you want in. As you go to lower and lower, you can only draw a limited amount out. And that limited amount depends on the neutral hydrogen concentration. There are three cases here with uh, that should be 10 to the 4. As you go down in neutral hydrogen, you go down in flux. That also works for O+. Plus. If you go down in density of O+, plus, you go down in flux. It works out both ways. Now, the applications of all of this are uh, a bit more complicated. The di uh, global distribution of thermal plasma depends very crucially on the uh, global pattern, the time-dependent pattern of uh, global electric fields. Uh, in this uh, context, one could say that the distribution of thermal plasma is a secondary effect of a primary cause, the primary cause being the, the electric fields that are set up uh, throughout the magnetosphere. In any case, uh, there is certainly the possibility of loss of plasma. Uh, one continually sees at high latitudes uh, all the way down uh, fr from what we term here an inner plasmosphere and an outer plasmosphere. In all of these regions out in here, one finds an outflow of plasma. Now, it does depend on local time. It's a, a complicated topic, but much of this is uh, uh, certainly indicative, as Ian pointed out, that uh, the, the, these protons are being lost out of the magnetosphere. They're not reappearing at some other local time sector and being pushed back in. At least the area where that could happen is getting smaller and smaller. It must look like a, if it really is happening that they're coming back into the atmosphere, it must be a very small location that we haven't found yet. And it's easier to believe right now that they're just uh, going away from the magnetosphere continually. And Ian has pointed out that the, this affects the, the helium budget in a very crucial way. Uh, what we're trying to indicate here are, again, the three different regions, the high latitude polar uh, wind regions where you have what appears to be, from observational evidence, a, a fairly continuous outflow of plasma going out like this. Uh, you have the plasma trough region in here where the field lines uh, uh, appear to be closed, although they may be open at times. Uh, you have a theoretical problem, which has to be resolved, of what happens when you have these colliding beams of plasma coming out of opposite hemispheres. Do they set up shock fronts? Is it just a big amorphous blob of plasma that accumulates there and sort of moves back down the field line as this whole convection pattern rotates around the Earth? It's uh, very difficult to know. You have the same sequence uh, inside here, uh, and I'd like to draw a distinction between the inner plasmosphere and outer plasmosphere in the sense that we know that there are very strong impulses of uh, westward electric field which drive plasma inwards on the night side. And when this happens, much of the plasma that's stored along the magnetic uh, flux tube is jammed down into the ionosphere. Uh, it does this, if you looked at the total velocity of the plasma, of course you have a parallel component, you have a perpendicular component, so you get velocity vectors which sort of point in towards the equatorial regions. It's a, a region which uh, the topic of actually computing what the temperature and density uh, is when you have these very impulsive fields uh, associated with substorms. It's um, a very interesting topic and a number of people working on it right now. In any case, uh, it, what it appears is that the, uh, these sudden impulses and substorms actually compress the plasma. Uh, convection either sweeps it away on the day side or compresses it down to some hardcore inner, inner plasmosphere. And that uh, the, after these impulsive events, impulsive I mean periods up to perhaps half an hour to an hour and a half, uh, the convective field may withdraw back poleward. Uh, this may be very closely associated with the diffuse aurora, which um, from the Chatnik observations is very intimately connected with the, uh, at least the part of the uh, ionosphere we see in the plasma drift. 
with uh, westward fields being very small on the equatorward side of the diffuse aurora and moderately large inside the diffuse aurora. But in any case, uh, we do have this hard, you know, hardcore inner plasmosphere. We have a region now which uh, perhaps defines the, the uh, extent of the, the present level of convection, and this could be actually the diffuse aurora. And you have a region in here which now will be the plasmosphere if you give it enough time to fill up. That's the filling problem that Ian referred to. Now, you've taken away most of the plasma here at the time uh, during the substorm onset. It has to refill. It's indistinguishable from the trough in the first uh, period of time, but its volume is substantially less than the volume here. You are accumulating plasma in here. You don't know its distribution along the magnetic field line. You may have a tremendous, uh, much more plasma in this part of it than you have in this part of it. It is. It doesn't look like a diffusive equilibrium. We, we don't know, though. We, we do know that satellites that come across it like this see a very sharp boundary here, whereas you go across it here in the ionosphere, things get very confused, uh, even if you look at uh, light protons alone. But the, I think it's indicative from many of the Goddard results that when you go across these particular boundaries that you begin to see uh, increases in the proton density, uh, or decreases, sorry, as you go across, beginning as far back as here, which is an L of 2, and then the density continually decreases in a very smooth fashion till it hits uh, a rock bottom level, continues through into here when you finally get into the auroral oval where the density rises, and then you go into all sorts of effects where you find it difficult to separate uh, temperature gradients uh, from actual um, effects of uh, vertical uh, density profiles. Well, all in all, it's a fairly complex business. Uh, the, these high-speed upward flows, uh, the computations still give velocities on the order of 10 to 30 uh, kilometers per second for many of the flows that are filling up out in here. We need to know what's happening here. If you suddenly have ring current protons filling up and out in here, you'd like to know what happens to thermoplasma when it uh, comes into all of that, because it's the, the gradient in plasma pressure which determines much of the, the flow parameters of the low, low energy part of the spectrum, and the interaction between that and the high energy part of the spectrum just is not, is not known. Um, I think that uh, brings us fairly well up to date on, on what we, we think we know. Theory uh, certainly is ahead of experiment in this particular area. And uh, it's no wonder, uh, if you look back in the papers of 1960, uh, IGY period, the thermal plasma had the same, the same general characteristic as the ether of special relativity. Uh, that is, that it was always postulated to be there, but you didn't know much about it. But whereas the ether has been proven not to exist in some people's minds, at least we know we do have some ther thermal plasma sitting out there. Thank you. Peter, I want to ask for a clarification. Uh, you mentioned uh, something about the diffuser or and its relationship to the plasma trough. Right. And I, I thought you said that it might coincide or something like that, but I think that, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but there's, there's a fair amount of evidence, in fact, that the equatorward edge of that plasma trough coincides with the lower boundary of the uh, diffuse aurora. That's, that's a real firm identification. Yeah, that's uh, the, the real problem is to decide what the distribution of electric field is around the diffuse aurora. And you see frequently very sudden uh, expansions of the diff diffuse aurora, uh, tremendously equatorward. I mean, uh, well beyond uh, what you'd normally ascribe to the auroral oval, simply because it's very difficult to see the diffuse aurora from well, the ground. Well, you when it's pretty messed up, if you want to go back in the midnight yeah. sector. But on the flanks, really, it's pretty clear, I think, that the... Uh, well, maybe the midnight sector that's important, not the flanks. That, that was the point um, I was trying to make, that if you have a very sudden equatorward expansion of the diffuse aurora, you may miss it on uh, all of the optical techniques. Uh, and yet that is essentially compressing an enormous area of the night side. But it, uh, I'll certainly admit it's, uh, it's an uncertainty, but it's one that should, people should be aware of, of a certain connection there. Bill, did, you, did I understand you to say, just, uh, did I understand you to say that the, the evidence is that the diffuse aurora comes to down near the uh, equatorward edge of the trough? Is that the? Yes, the trough. Yeah. The, you're going from the equator towards the uh, poles come down through the trough and as soon as you hit the uh, uh, poleward edge of the trough, the oh, density polar starts up. Polar. 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 Did I say that wrong? Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think that's a very, a very important uh, 
the thing that we need to, to clarify, just the, essentially the, the bulging of convection field lines out of the, uh, the diffuse rural region. Into. There is another signature that's actually right in there that uh, uh, Peter was discussing the uh, interaction of the hot plasma and the cold plasma. Whatever it is, it heats up the plasma that's associated, I, I think, with red arcs. Uh, there is also observed, and I'm, I'm afraid I have a lot of these observations, I haven't published them, but uh, there are some others that have been put out immediately, I think. There's, a, there's oftentimes a very drastic increase in the uh, plasma temperature, the, the thermal plasma temperature, as you go out this way again, right at the edge, right inside the edge, I suspect, of the, of the plasma pause, yes, and perhaps extending, we don't really know that boundary that well, so to tell you exactly where it is, but right across that boundary, but when you get out into the plasma trough, beyond the plasma pause, that thermal temperature of the uh, plasma really drops dramatically before you get to the uh, um, the soft or rural zone or whatever, whatever. Drops or rises? It drops. So, so the temperature is high here and then low? Up yes, there. you have a very steep temperature bulge mm -hmm. here. This is without any conjugate mm -hmm. photo electron in it, which is another effect. But these are, there is definitely some kind of heating right here that comes back down, at least in the ions, <coughs> before you get to the soft or rural zone there, the pH plasma drops. Inside the plasma Well, all I can say is that it looks, I would say that it coincides pretty well with this boundary that Peter's shown right here. It's cold on the outside of that, and it's generally cold on the inside of that. And I think that there's a lot of other there that's inside or outside. But near that boundary, and I don't really know whether it's outside the boundary or just inside the boundary. Oftentimes, it's fairly spread out, particularly down inside. I know. One point that I forgot to mention, uh, there are some very nice results that Chung Park will probably be talking about here on the filling of this uh, outer plasma sphere and uh, from Whistler data showing very nicely that uh, it takes uh, many days to fill this part. And so if you pick very quiet conditions, you can get where you fill up this to a fairly uniform level, then you can make very nice correspondences and watch the effects of diffuse aurora on the, in the first substorms that come along. Ready? Ernest, Ernest Fontheim. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, there, I, there seemed to be somewhat of a disagreement with what, between what you said on your first or second slide and this slide, if I understood you correctly. Now, you said in the beginning that the location of the trough in the ionosphere is connected magnetically to the plasma sheet, which puzzled me, but actually here on this slide, it uh, conforms to what my original prejudice was, namely, that it's actually connected to the plasma pores, which is still uh, in the region of, of closed field lines. Did I misunderstand you? Or? Uh, perhaps I explained it incorrectly, but the, certainly the latter explanation is what yeah. I would think. It, the, the trough is actually the inside edge of right. the uh, plasma okay. sheet. The other question I have is that um, also in some earlier slide, you had. Or, wait a minute. Did you say now that the trough is the inside edge of the plasma sheet? Well, I, I would say that the, the, the I would put the uh, no. diffuse aurora uh, right along. Let's see if we're going to let that be right along something like this. That is, I'd let the uh, the trough. Uh, I, I mean, I will still say that I, I don't know whether we're going to put the uh, diffuse aurora here as a quiet time. I'd put it right out here, but I would I would not rule out that it uh, could actually move down very substantially. Uh, for short periods of time. Well, could, could you indicate where is the plasma pause on, on, on this diagram? Isn't that the... Well, the plasma pause is a very tricky uh, thing. Uh, the, you see, if you're measuring it uh, coming across in the equatorial plane, you would identify it as being out here because you would see uh, just a tremendous vacuum out here with a tenth per cc and perhaps go up to one to ten per cc across here. Uh, you can also... Uh, well, there aren't many results that would show you going across both of those, but the, uh, there are a few observations of that sort of thing. If you're flying along here, looking uh, from the Earth, then it's very confusing because you have the effect of the proton flow uh, and the effect of uh, local time variations in the proton uh, density, I mean the O plus density, uh, really confusing things. And so you see a very gradual decrease, a decrease in the proton density as you go this way, going up towards the pole. Okay. Oh, another question, um, also on some of the, or one of the earlier slides, you had the, uh, in, the plasma pause indicated by, um, and uh, where you had, I think you said there's a current sheet which actually prevents or could prevent plasma convection across field lines. 
You're referring yeah. to the, the just the, the ring current? Yeah, I think particle. that's right. Yeah. We put that in just for show. Oh, because here you do have convection across. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, that is a problem. That, uh, certainly, uh, if you had really depleted this region, you could start the ring current off in here, and it wouldn't uh, necessarily be lost immediately if you could push it in far enough. Yeah. And they must be related. Uh, John you. Evans, uh, you, you identify the, the boundary between the inner plasma sphere and the outer plasma sphere with the light ion trough, I think. But wouldn't it more, be more reasonable on the basis of what you've just told us to say that really the distinction is how far the substorm electric fields can penetrate inside the plasma sphere? Well, they're both, both tied together. Uh, and it's not the, even the longitudinal extent of convection fields, the westward fields, isn't known. And so uh, it's certainly possible, say from Chung Park's work, that you just have a very narrow longitude sector that's getting compressed. And so if you go along in longitude, you get a, a, a very funny view of what all of this plasma sphere looks like. But the, uh, I wouldn't identify uh, the light ion trough necessarily. Uh, that, that's what I was saying. It's a very complicated thing, and you have to know all the conditions that led to it. But if, if you did have a big plasma sphere and applied a very sudden uh, strong uh, westward electric field and you compressed all that plasma down the ionosphere and you knew that it was in saturation flowing back up, then your light ion trough would be right here at these points. But in fact, it's always more confusing because these things are happening every two hours and the, uh, the typical result that you see in many of the Goddard um, things, and perhaps I'll speak to them later, uh, is that the density just begins almost a continuous decrease across here. And it's only in a very small local time sector near midnight that you get a very abrupt light ion trough, such as the example I showed. But at other local times, it's much more confusing, and it's awfully hard to find the uh, plasma sphere from, say, 1,000 kilometers or 1,500 kilometer altitude. In general, if you're doing what you say, just crunching in a plasma over a rather wide longitude range, just crunching out somewhere else, I mean, you're going to conserve Yeah, you, you better, you better uh, keep uh, curly approximately zero. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Uh, I want to change the sub t topic slightly, but you spoke of um, dual heating in the polar wind. Now, since there's no net charge transfer by the solar wind, just would you like to define what you meant? Yes, the, the general term dual heating refers, uh, you're probably aware of it, refers to a difference in velocity between electrons and ions. And that's the dual heating you would get in a, a semiconductor or metal. Uh, in fact, the, the term dual heating is, in the atmospheric context is broader, where it refers to a difference of flow velocities between any two species, between uh, 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 ions and neutrals, or between two different species of ions. And what we're referring to, and that's a term which appears on the right-hand side of any energy balance, and uh, has a collision frequency and mass factors and difference <coughs> in relative velocity. Isn't that a rather odd thing? Because you get this dual heating without any electric field. Uh, there is an electric field. But, it, but it's not essential to that dual heating. Term. That's not essential. It's, it's only that you've set up, it's a frictional heating, which uh, in as a context is dual heating in most uh, thermodynamics texts. Keith Cole can't contain himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'd just like to say that it, it may be confusing to use the word dual heating in this circumstance. Why not just stick to frictional heating? I mean, we've known that when a block of wood slides over a surface, there is frictional heating. Uh, dual heating, in, in its initial, original context, is J dot E. Uh, if, uh, now, I could imagine a situation <laughs> in which there was no J in your context, but simply uh, a moving of the proton plasma through the oxygen plasma, and there is frictional heating. Sure, the dual heating ultimately is collisions between particles, but unless there is the J, there is strictly no dual heating in, in its classical context. And I think it might confuse people if you use the term in that broader sense. I think it would be preferable to stick to the term frictional heating. I suppose it's J because it's dual, but it's uh, the <laughs> no. Uh, the it really is immaterial uh, what you call it, except for the confusion factor. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I think with that we really we could go on for sure, a long time, but we do have a number of other papers that we've got to get through this morning. These remarks, most of them, are going to apply in a lot of the other talks which we have anyway. I suspect so. I mean, I'll let you. Sorry, I didn't mean it in that sense. <laughs> we are talking about the same subject. It was a review, Joe. Right, that was a review. <laughs>
So uh, I think we'd better get on to the next paper here until we sort out how this time schedule is going to go.